Good morning. Welcome to today's uh, Family Finances 101. My name is Dale J. Duransburg, Jr. You're going to get four basic benefits from this course this morning. Number one benefit, you're going to get the course itself. It's a fun, fast-paced course. It's about two, two and a half hours long. It's going to give you roughly 136 principles of success through seven spheres of money. Okay, I would like to call it from uh, nuts and bolts or cradle to grave. Everything that mom and dad did not know about teaching you, we're going to teach you this morning. The second thing that you're going to get, if you look over here to my left, which is stage right, you're going to get access to a comprehensive financial education plan that comes with the course itself. No additional cost. And the most important part about this plan, we're going to focus on what I would call the important points of family budgeting. We're going to give you a household analysis, a monthly cash flow, because in today's economy, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. So if you have more money going out than you have coming in, you have a cash flow problem. And a lot of wealthy people know cash flow analysis are the most important thing to success in business. Your family is a business, regardless if you know it or not. Other thing that we're going to give you is important, we're going to talk about emergency fund. Because in this economy, people are getting laid off, things of that nature happen, and you need to have money set aside. Not a savings account, an emergency fund. Another thing we're going to give you is a college analysis. Just to give you a brief sample of what the plan consists of, it's a 20-page report. And most importantly for me, as being a person who believes in God, we're going to give you a tithing analysis or a charitable analysis. We'll show you how to go from zero to 20% of giving over the course of 12 months. And a lot of people don't believe that's possible, but you'll find out that it is. And also touching on your retirement. We'll give you a retirement analysis, where you are today, where you need to be when you hit the retirement button so you don't outlive your resources. Does that make sense? Okay, great. The third thing you're going to get this morning, you're going to get access again to a complimentary consultation from the seven spheres of money. We have 14 different sponsors throughout seven states. And primarily, most uh, people need uh, consultations from accountants, attorneys, and planners. And planners, generally, if they're real good at what they do, they have an insurance background as well. So you'll have access to a 15, 30-minute complimentary consultation as you proceed through the course upon your request. And last but not least, as you all see here, you're going to walk away with what I call a financial workbook. This financial workbook will enable you to go sit down with your professional that you're already working with, or it will enable you to ask questions when you are looking for that professional to work with. And if you don't have a professional to work with, we've already qualified and vetted professionals across the country to assist you in those seven different spheres of money. Alrighty? So, let's talk about why financial education. I'll read that first caption. I have enough money to last me the rest of my life unless I buy something. Anybody ever had that feeling? <laughs> One thing I come to find out in life, if you want to find financial success, you find the people who have already created financial success and you follow their success pattern. Abraham Lincoln said you can learn two things from people, what to do, what not to do. So if you want to be successful, follow the successful people first. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Now, a budget is a mathematical confirmation of your suspicions. A mathematical confirmation of your suspicions. You ever thought about how many people here by show of hands actually adhere to a budget on a regular basis? Okay. Well, guess what? About half of us raise our hand. Guess what? The other half, be rest assured, we can help you. A budget is not that intimidating. All right? So let's go to the book. This is going to be a fill-in. So as I give you the answers, fill those in. Okay? Total household debt has soared to what percent of our disposable income? 100%? That was 2% too high. It's actually 98%. So the answer is 98% of our disposable income. So the average American now spends approximately what percent of what they earn? The average American spends approximately what percent of what they earn? It's higher than 100. It actually is. What do, you guys, what do you guys think? How high above 100 is it? 122%. 122%. Now, in 2003, guess what happened? More Americans declared bankruptcy than graduated from college. In 2003. Now, 90% of those people filing bankruptcy today, what class do you think they fall into? The middle class. That's exactly correct. So what our objective here in the Learning Institute for Financial Education is to give you the principles the resources for you to sustain the middle class lifestyle, and most importantly, give you the principles and resources to take you to the next level. And if you have kids and grandkids, you want to be a personal example to help them actually stand on your shoulders 
from where you ended so they can start. Not, you know, when you get 18, you're on your own. You should give them the, you know, standards and the tools so they can pass you. That's what true significance is. Would anyone agree with that? Great. So let's go to the book. Where is America headed? Right now, our outstanding consumer debt is over $2 trillion. That doesn't include your house or your cars. We're talking about the things when you went to Best Buy, you went to Bath and Body Beyond, you went to Toys R Us, uh, you went and did that impulse shopping. Over $2 trillion worth of consumable debt. And you know, there was a study taken at the Harvard Business School five years ago that said after the holidays, your children, 90% of them could not tell you what gifts they got about 60 days after the holidays. So, so think about that. I'm not saying don't give your kids gifts, but think about it in the way the times are today, what's more of a value to them that they can take and has a keepsake for the rest of their lives. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Now look at this conversely, look at the personal savings pattern. Again, this goes back from 1960 to the millennium. We used to at one point in time in America save about 10 to 11% of our take home pay. Right now, we save less at a negative 2%. Now, understand this, China and their residents with their household income or middle class is about $28,000, they save 40% of their take home pay. That's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> well, we're all educators here, right? There's an institution called the Personal Financial Literacy Coalition. What they do is they go out in America and they teach financial education from K to 12th grade. They gave a survey to seniors in high school and senior citizens had four basic questions. First question was, what's the difference between a certificate of deposit and a money market account? Anybody want to give me the answer to that? Anybody know that? The most important thing is, if you don't know, how can your kids know? That question there was failed. Only 85% of senior citizens knew the answer to that question. The seniors in high school 52% only knew the question. Second question that they asked them, if you invest in the stock market, are you guaranteed a return? 90% of senior citizens said no, which was the right answer, but 10% said yes. Over 70% of seniors in high school said yes. If I put money in like an ATM, I get money out, regardless of the circumstances. The third question they asked them, what's the difference between a municipal bond and a mutual fund? By show of hands, how many people have retirement plans? Okay, so if you have retirement plans and you don't know the difference between a municipal bond and a mutual fund, you need to have this course because most of your retirement plans have some form of bonds and some form of mutual funds. Doesn't that make sense? So if your advisor is giving you advice and you really don't know what he or she is giving you, how do you know you're going down the right track? Ever thought about that? That makes sense? Americans are saving less than at any time since 1933. Are saving less than any time since 1933. What was going on in America in 1933? The Great Depression. What are we going into right now? A recession that is tilting on a depression. You want to know what the definition between a recession and depression is? You know what? When my neighbor loses his job, that's a recession. When I lose my job, that's a depression. <laughs> Let's go back to the book real quickly and let's give you some more tips. Most Americans lack training in basic financial skills. How many of you guys and ladies actually took a financial course prior to today or took one in college, took one in high school? Okay. But if you look across the board, that was only about a third of the room. But we're all well educated here, so why aren't we taking courses on things that we need to know about on a daily basis in our lives? Only 4% of all Americans follow a written financial plan. Only 4% of Americans follow a written financial plan. So if we go over here to my stage right again, if you're not looking at your finances at least one hour a month, guess what? You're doing yourself a disservice. How much did people's retirement plans take a hit over the last two, three months? 20, 30, 40%, right? Most people did. But when that was happening, did you pick up the phone, talk to your advisor, talk to your accountant, 
talk to your lawyer. What are some things and strategies I should have been doing? Here's what we recommend for you to do at the Learning Institute for Financial Education. On a quarterly basis, you should have a conversation with one of those three individuals. Because you may be going into a new job, coming out of a job, getting a raise, owning a business, so they need to give you what to look for on the horizon. Make sense? All right, let's go back to the book real quickly. The bottom line here, ladies and gentlemen, is your minds are like parachutes. If they're not open, they won't work. Most Americans never learn the fundamentals, the fundamentals of financial success. So let's move right along and let's go to chapter two and talk about are you successful financially? A bank is a place that will lend you money if you can prove you don't need it. It's, it's kind of like celebrity. You know how celebrities always getting all this free stuff? But when they were struggling as a waitress, you know, back in some small cafe, nobody was giving them anything. But now that they're famous, they give them everything free. So here's what we want to do. We want to ask you to write down your definition in the book of what it is or a definition to achieving financial success to you. Take about 30 seconds and write down your definition of what financial success means to you. And I'll give you one example. One of my definitions or my wife's definition is, is that her bank account never goes empty and she can just write checks without having to worry about it. <laughs> so take about 30 seconds, write down what a definition of financial success means to you. Because your actions are already telling us what financial success means to you. But let's make sure they line up to what your mission statement says. Because you're either working with a mission statement or you're not. You know, I may be dating myself, but when I grew up, in my household, my parents said, there's only three things you need to know, Dale. Don't ask us any other questions. One, you live in a safe house, you got a roof over your head, and you got a good school to go to with food in your stomach. Any other questions? It's none ya. <laughs> or none of your business. You know what? That may have been appropriate back then, but guess what? We live in the information age, and we're in a global economy. That is no longer appropriate. You need to educate your kids about your finances. You don't have to expose everything, but you need to give them the tenements and the principles so that they can understand what it costs for you to provide the lifestyle that they have. Does that resonate? All right, let's go back to the book. Let's talk about the lifestyles of the financially successful. Line number one, they spend less than they earn. They spend less than they earn. Again, most of this information is gonna be common sense, but my question to you, ladies and gentlemen, are you applying it on a daily, monthly, quarterly, yearly basis? If you are, kudos, then pass it on to someone else. If you're not, let us give you the resources to help you get engaged to change some of those habits. Number two, they operate their family finances like a successful business. Because guess what? You have a business in your household. It's your personal budget, which is your economy. No matter what's going on in the world economy or the US economy, your economy is more important than that. There are people right now that are doing even better in the last quarter than they were doing before because their personal economy was set up for this time. There's always ways to make money. It's just a matter of do you know the right way that's for you legally, ethically, and morally sound. Let's go right back to the book. Successful people direct discretionary spending towards accumulating assets. Assets. Assets will give you wealth. Anybody know the definition between an asset and a liability? Want to share with us, Lynn? Your, your definition between an asset and a liability? Mm -hmm. Yep. Anybody ever heard of a gentleman named Robert Kiyosaki? Wrote a book named Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah. He said, let me give you a basic definition of an asset and a liability. An asset, when times are tough, will continue to feed you without your you know, personal you know, work effort. A liability will take money out of your pocket. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. By show of hands, how many people own their own, their own house? They're their homeowners. Is that an asset? Could be. Nope. Let me give you a definition again. Do you have utilities? Yes. You have taxes? Yes. Maintenance? Yes. So who's paying who on a monthly basis? Now, who has a mortgage by show of hands? Okay, guess what? It's an asset on your banker's general ledger, not yours. Now, here's an asset. Now, if you own a property and somebody's living in it and they're paying you rent, it's an asset. Now, the first time I heard that from Robert, I said, whoa, hold up, Robert. No, it's not. He said, okay, well, go cash it in right now. And where are you living when you cash it in? 
It's an asset, but technically it's not an asset while you're living in it. When you cash out of it or move it, then it's an asset. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Let's go back to the book. Assets are things that produce income now or in the future. Assets are things that produce income now or in the future. So you have skills that are assets, right? So if you are you know, employed, then that's an asset. But what's happening to America now? We are getting behind in technology, science, engineering. We're not as green as other countries are. So we have old assets that are now liabilities. Make sense? Look at the big three. They want $25, $45 billion to keep on that 1980 paradigm versus the 21st century paradigm. Should we reward them? Mm, that's up to the government. <laughs> Let's go back to the book. Smart people pay themselves first or second, and that's based on their belief system. I myself, I'm a Christian, so I pay myself second. But I never pay myself third. Okay? So if you find yourself in a situation where you have a lot of bills and expenses and you haven't abide by that rule of paying you know, yourself first because you have put out into the market what you want to receive back, which is nothing. You haven't put any investment into the, to the ground for it to sprout up. When's the best time to grow a tree? Well, it was yesterday when that acorn fell off the tree, but today is the best day. <laughs> okay, let's look up here at this illustration. Let's look at the benefits of living smart. Everyone can see that? Your average work life expectancy is about 40 years. So from 25 to 65, let's assume that you were investing these savings by doing a lot of little things right at a 9% yield. That's a pretty good return. How many people get excited about getting 9% return on all their investments right now? Absolutely. So let's look at this. Let's say you were smart enough to use those $5 worth of coupons and not buy the candy in the aisle when you, use, when you got the savings, but you put that money in your bank. So if you were to take $5 worth of coupons at a grocery store, get a 9% return over 40 years, you put extra $101,000 in your pocket. Is that exceptional? It's, again, it's not sexy, but it's common sense. <laughs> it's sexy to us, absolutely. But second thing, don't buy $10 worth of lottery tickets. I know none of us are guilty of that. <laughs> But if you buy $10 worth of lottery tickets, guess how much you are spending over the course of 40 years? A lot of money. What's the odds of you winning a lottery? One in two million. Don't smoke a pack of cigarettes. I know none of us do that, but how much is the cost of a pack of cigarettes? Man, I don't know. It's more than gas. And imagine those people who are smoking two, three packs a week. $561,000. These are real numbers. I'm not just making these up. How about if you, you know, brown bag it? $5 for lunch, $4 for breakfast, $5 for a meal. That's $20 a day, 30 days in a month, $600. That's not including when, you know, you go to the movies and stuff like that. These are what we call hidden foxes because they're so small that they really don't ping you on a one-on-one, -on -one, but on a cumulative mountain. Right? Mole into a mountain. That resonate? Half a million dollars. Now, here's the one that a lot of people don't like. Drive used cars or pre-owned cars. Now, let me also preface this. If you have earned and can afford a new car and do all these things, do it because you only live once. But if you are doing these things and it is eliminating you from living a lifestyle and having retirement, then there's a challenge in your household. Does that make sense? Average baby boomer, $869,000. Average baby boomer needs 1.5 million to live comfortably into the 80s. I just showed you 2.3 million ways of becoming successful without adding another penny to your income with your existing budget. So smart people, they go into debt reluctantly and get out quickly. Smart people go into debt reluctantly and get out quickly. They seek financial advice from professionals. They seek pro financial advice from professionals. So guess what? Even though my grandfather didn't have a degree or anything, he was a professional. So my first advice came from his example. Never had a word to me about money, but I saw his examples. Next one, they follow a written plan. Again, 
If you don't have a plan, you have a plan for failure. If you didn't know you needed a plan and now you do, get yourself a plan. If it's just a regular budget, you just wrote some things down and you just adhere to them and check the cost of things you were spending. Because psychologically, your mind works 24 seven even when you sleep. And your mind will start to direct you in the right path. No matter what your belief system is, this is a universal law. All right, let's go to the book. Now, just in case you don't wanna be successful, let me give you three great excuses. Would that be okay? Yes. <laughs> Number one, I don't have a high income. Everybody's saying that, I don't earn enough money. <laughs> so I can't be successful. Number two, I don't have a college degree. Hmm, well, go tell my grandfather that. You know, go tell Bill Gates that. Go tell Michael Dale that. Average multi-billionaires in the United States today and this uh, generation, only about 20% of them have college degrees. Isn't that amazing? And number three, I wasn't born rich. You know, I didn't have that silver spoon in my mouth. So most importantly, here's what's important, ladies and gentlemen. My success depends on what I do with what I make. My success depends on what I do with what I make. Does that make sense? All right, let's turn the page to chapter three, and let's talk about the lifestyles of the working broke. We just gave you some, some principles and, and, and guidelines of successful people. Now let's talk about reality. Only 5% of Americans are financially independent. That means they own everything they have. They don't have to worry about money. Okay, 2.7% of Americans make over $100,000. These are based on SSI and IRS.gov. You can go to those websites. As, as prosperous as we are, we really don't make a lot per capita when you look at all the facts. So we are above the learning curve, all right? Here's what we want you to do. In the booklet, as you see here, on the left-hand side, there's some hash marks. We're gonna share these examples of these uh, lifestyles of people who are financially, you know, encumbered, and if this applies to you, just check it off. One of the most important things for you to improve your life is to figure out where you are and then make corrections. It's kind of what they say at the Alcohol Anonymous. First thing you need to do is admit that you are an alcoholic. I had to admit that I was, you know, financially troubled about 10 years ago. And when I picked up a book, went to a class and took some course corrections, I got myself out of the muck. So if we go over something that applies to you, check it off. If it doesn't, don't. So let's move right ahead. Unsuccessful people, they spend...